Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 3. And we're going to read the first six verses, and I wanted to let everyone know that I'd like everyone to pray, and I'll, when I pray for the message, I'll also pray for Mary as well. But she's going to have a heart procedure tomorrow, and I know she'll appreciate everybody's prayer. Yes. And um, they're going to go in and try to get her heart beating at the normal cadence and rate and everything like that. So it's going to be using a lot of electronics. And Robert, I'm getting a, a hiss and... I don't know why. I, I, is it strange? Does it sound strange to you? Okay. Robert, if you want to just put it on the pulpit mic, that's fine because see, like in my ears up here, I couldn't even. Better there. Okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna get rid of this. I think you know we'll just set up a thicker. All right. All right. You can hear me fine now clear okay good good all right and so we're going to read the first six verses and then we will get into our first story and right into god's word okay hebrews 3 and notice another chapter unfortunately begins with the word therefore let me put that up there everyone okay there we go okay uh that's kind of strange but you ought to remember that the chapter divisions aren't inspired of God. Those were done by human beings, and for some reason they put it right in the middle of a sentence. But if we think back to what we lo looked at last week with chapter 2, the, many times it was talking about the sufferings of our Lord Jesus. He was our leader. He was our trailblazer. He suffered. We will suffer. Therefore, therefore, holy brethren, notice there, it's clear he's talking to people who are saved, all right? Is it too low? My voice is too low or what? It's ringing. Okay, Robert will take care of that. Sorry about that. Uh, therefore, holy brethren, he's not talking to unbelievers, everyone. He's talking to uh, people who are saved, all right? Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, Consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him. Now notice the word faithful there. You're going to see this word often. Faithful, faithful. Moses was faithful. Jesus was faithful. Christ Jesus was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses was also faithful in all his house. By the way, the house there in connection with Moses would have to do with the tabernacle. You remember God told him, Moses, I want you to build this tabernacle where I'm going to dwell, identical to the one I'm going to show you that's in heaven. You're going to build it exactly like I tell you. He was faithful to do that and faithful to operate and to oversee that. So he was faithful in doing that. And then in verse 3, after talking about Jesus's, Jesus and Moses' faithfulness, for this one, capital O, Jesus, for this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. Okay, obviously, the person who designs and build, builds a house, you know, you don't applaud the house, right? You applaud the one who designed it, built it, all right. Okay, for every house, verse 4, is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. Of course, Jesus was uh, the one who created all things. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. All right, so we've got that. Now, he who built all things is God. Verse 5. And Moses, indeed, was faithful in all his house as a servant. Remember that word, servant as a servant for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward. But Christ as a son. Notice the difference. Moses is faithful as a servant. Christ is faithful as a son over his own house, whose house we are if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the whole 
firm to the end. Now, you'll remember this. You Hopefully you will. Not too many years ago, I shared the story about the Tuskegee Airmen based on George Lucas's 2012 film called Red Tails. If you've never seen it, it's fantastic. And it provides a dramatized version of the true events behind a World War II group of soldiers called the Tuskegee Airmen. That was their names. Formerly, they belonged to the 332nd Fighter Group, the 477th Bombardment Group of the U.S. Army Air Corps. The nickname Red Tails was coined after the group began to paint uh, the tails of their aircraft red and even the, the fronts of them as well. Now, the Tuskegee Airmen, I'm going to put another slide here, they were the first African-American military aviators in the United States Armed Forces. They held a hugely important position in the European Air War. And here's why. U.S. bombers were getting shot down, okay? U.S. bombers were getting shot down at increasingly uh, high rates, okay? The, the planes that were loaded with bombs and were dropping those bombs, they were getting shot down by the enemy. More and more and more. Now, why is this? Well, because the U.S. fighters that were supposed to protect those planes, when enemy aircraft came, they began to peel off and go after them. But there was a ploy because they'd get the protective planes to take off, and now the bomber, this gigantic plane with these bombs hanging on it, is a sitting duck. It's all by itself because they're out there trying to fight these enemies over here. They're going all over the place. And so the government had to do something. The leaders of, of the, uh, the Air Force said, hey, we've got to come up with a better plan there. We're losing bombers, and every one of those, those planes that were bombers had 11 or 12 soldiers on it, or I should say airmen, that were being killed with every plane that got taken out. So the Tuskegee Airmen were brought in. And they were given a different strategy. They were given a different plan. Here it is. Never leave the bombers alone. Never. Never do that. When the enemy attacked, they were to stay right there with the bombers. And they were, you know, you had the guys in those things that they had machine guns. They were dealing with these other planes coming in. And they were staying right next to the bombers. They weren't going off. And it turned everything around. Suddenly, very, very few planes. In fact, the hundreds of bombing uh, excursions that the Air Force had, the hundreds of them, in all those hundreds of, of trips of those bombers, only 25 were taken down under the watchful eye of the Tuskegee Airmen. Okay, so they did a phenomenal job. Hundreds of excursions, only two dozen or so bombers taken out. All right? If you were flying a bomber, if you were on that plane filling up all the things that they did to get the bombs dropped, okay, you wanted the Tuskegee Airmen watching you because they were the best. They were top-notch. And in the movie, there's one place where they're on a tarmac, thousands of miles from home, and they start chanting their chant to encourage each other as they're about to go on another mission. And here it is. They began to shout their motto, the last plane, the last bullet, the last man, the last minute, we fight. The last plane, the last bullet, the last man, the last minute, we fight. And they begin to chant that over and over it because that's what they were standing for. Nothing was going to get them off the track, okay? And to this very day, now there's hardly any left. This is an older picture from like 10, 12 years ago. Listen, there may be five or less Tuskegee Airmen, okay? There were droves of them at one time. But there, are, and you got to realize these people are 98, 99, 100, 102, okay? They're way up there. It's a miracle any of them are still alive. Back, the last Tuskegee Airman from Chicago just died just a few years ago. He's the last one in the Chicago area. There's no Tuskegee Airmen anywhere in Chicago now. But there's still a very few number alive. 
and they're celebrated. Why? They weren't just excellent pilots. They weren't just the cream of the crop World War II fighter pilot. But they were exceedingly faithful to their duty. They were faithful to do what they were called to do. They never left their charge. They stayed faithful to their calling. And they had courage. They had tenacity, which is extremely rare. They were commanded to protect those U.S. bombers. And they did it. And they fought till the very last minute. And they were faithful to the end. Now let's go back to our scripture reading. To put these two together. In Hebrews chapter 3, now we didn't read the whole chapter, even though I'm going to kind of breeze through the chapter. And again, since these chapters are very long and sometimes complicated, I'm giving highlights all through the book of Hebrews. Okay, so we're not going to be able to do every single verse. It would take an entire year to do that, to do every verse in Hebrews and go through. But we can glean the main lessons from these chapters that are appropriate for our lives. Now, we didn't read the whole chapter, but if we had, we would notice immediately that God wasn't happy with his Old Testament saints that came out of, of Egypt. You all remember that. They got to the edge of the promised land and spies were sent in. And 12 spies were sent in and the spies come back. The two of them, Joshua and Caleb, they're like, no sweat. With God's help, we can take this land. We could win the military victory. Ten spies said, they're like grasshoppers in our sight. We're like grasshoppers in their sight. They're gigantic and we're, we'll get smeared. We'll get destroyed. And they were full of unbelief. They wouldn't trust God. They wouldn't trust God's promises to them that they, they could go in and do it without a sweat because God was going to be with them. And you know what? The people coming out of Egypt, the people sitting at the, at the promised land that should have gone in, they didn't get to go in because God brought judgment down upon them. What uh, we're getting here is the people in the book of Hebrews are in the same straits. They're, getting, they're ready to give up. They're afraid. They're fearful because the Christian life is getting too hard for them. These are Jewish people. They're paying a huge price. Their families are rejecting them. They're losing their jobs. The people around them are all against them, and it's very, very tough to follow Jesus. They were suffering. So what the author of Hebrews does is he does this, and this is a simple chart here, a simple graphic, but he's balancing in Hebrews 3 between being an encouragement to them but also being a leader to them, and he's warning them. So he's encouraging him, them, but there's sometimes he'll just come out with a warning. And you remember in chapter 2, we had the warning passage. He said, you need to listen more carefully. You need to take the more earnest heed, or you'll drift away. You are going to drift away unless you start listening carefully to Jesus. He's warning. He's going to do the same thing. We're going to see that in this chapter. He's giving them another warning. There's five major warnings. There's minor warnings, but there's five major warnings in the book of Hebrews because these people are ready, getting ready to go off the rail spiritually. Okay? So he encourages them. He warns them concerning this matter of loyalty. We talked about the Tuskegee Airmen. Faithful, loyal to what they were called to do and called to be. Nobody liked them. And that's what the writer of Hebrews is saying. You need to be loyal. You need to be faithful to the one who's given you eternal life. And that's the topic today. This is what I want to speak to you on for a few minutes this morning, this topic of faithfulness. And the title I've given today is The Huge Importance of Faithfulness to God. It's hugely important for all of us to be these kind of Christians. So let's pray. We're going to pray for our sister Mary Reed, and then we will get right into God's Word. Father, we thank you for your Word. We thank you, Lord, how it strengthens us and how it encourages us. And Lord, yes, it's how it rebukes us and warns us. And so we just ask that your Spirit would rest upon all that we do and say. And Lord, we ask that you would... Uh, bless Mary as tomorrow morning early she'll be at the hospital and undergoing this, this uh, 
a procedure, Lord, where they're going to have to do, use electrical pulses to her heart. And Lord, we just ask that your wall of protection will be around Mary and bless her and help her with her. We ask the doctors that for the, we pray for the doctors that they, Lord, would have your blessing on them as well. We pray all these things in Jesus' precious name and for his sake. Amen. All right. Alexander Solzhenitsyn. He's a Russian writer who spent years in a Siberian prison camp. Years. At one point, he had become completely discouraged, and he decided, all right, I'm checking out. I, I just want to die. I can't take this anymore. And so he decided what he was going to do. He worked out in the fields. He said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to go out in the fields, and I'm going to take my shovel, and I'm just going to stick my shovel in the ground, and I'm just going to lean upon my shovel until the guards come out and they start to beat me. And I'm just going to allow them to beat me to death. I'm going to resist them and so on and so forth. I'm going to make them kill me. Because he was just so discouraged, so depressed, he saw no hope. And when one of his co-workers, who was also a believer like Solzhenitsyn was, he saw him leaning and he knew what was going to happen to him. Very quickly he went over and he took his shovel and he quickly drew a cross in the soil in front of Solzhenitsyn. And all of a sudden Solzhenitsyn looked down and saw that and he immediately pulled his shovel out of the soil and the other man quickly erased the cross just as the guards got there. But that one quick picture that that co-worker put on the soil to Solzhenitsyn turned him around. He uh, said later that his entire life was energized by that little reminder of hope and courage. And he said he had the strength to continue because a fellow believer cared for him and remind of, reminded him of Christ's faithfulness to him and what he did for him on the cross and how he's suffering. So we get here to the beginning of Hebrews 3, everybody, and the author does this very thing to God's people, and you're also in danger of giving up. And in verse 1, he writes this, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider, and you'll notice I have that highlighted here, I've got some highlights here that are crucial. Consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses was also faithful in all his house. Okay? Jesus, Jesus, oh, I'm sorry, consider Jesus, who was faithful to him who appointed him. Consider Jesus who was faithful to him who had appointed him. So this brings us to our first lesson, everybody. Number one, when we are tempted to give up, we must meditate on Christ's amazing faithfulness to God. When we are tempted to give up, we've got to consider Jesus. That word consider means to contemplate Jesus. That's what it means, to meditate on him and his amazing faithfulness, and his promises to you and I. Because you know what? We're all human, and if, we don't, if we're not discouraged today, we might be discouraged tomorrow. And if we're not discouraged this week, we might be discouraged for the next two weeks after that. Discouragement is something that's very, very normal to human existence. But we don't want Satan to get the upper hand. Whatever we sense, discouragement immediately. You know, one of the verses I start thinking on is the verse where Paul said, I'm going to tell you God's will for you. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. And the third one was, let's see, rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. There's one more there to slip my mind. But that first one, rejoice evermore. That's what I'm focusing on anyway. 
That first one, rejoice evermore. I, I, I see that, and I remind myself of that, and I just say, you know what, Lord? You're right. I've got every reason to rejoice and no reason to be discouraged, okay? Because I'm a child of God. I have eternal life. My name is written in the book of life. Jesus is my Savior. The Holy Spirit is my uh, paraclete. He's my called along with me, the one who is called alongside me. He's right beside me. And we can begin to go down a list. Lord, you're wanting to give me an eternal rule with you. You're wanting me to rule and reign with you forever. You can go, and you know what? Suddenly, that cloud that gets over us, sometimes just because the sun isn't out. In Texas, we're used to seeing the sun all the time. But sometimes we'll get up and it'll be cloudy and it's dismal. And, you know, there's, there's all kinds of reasons that we could maybe be discouraged. But God says, no, don't do that because it's dangerous. All right? So the author's telling God's people, you want to give up? You want to throw in the towel? Well, you're not thinking clearly. You're focusing on you instead of uh, focusing on Jesus. You're focusing on all your pains and problems instead of focusing on the example he left you. Did Jesus give up? Can you think of his example? Did he give up? Did he stop sharing the truth God, of God's word with others because he was hated and was life was being threatened? No. Did he walk away from the cross? No, he went all the way to the very end and said, it is what? It is finished, right? So no, verse one says he was faithful to him. And I think it got blocked out, I'm sorry, because it somehow it got moved around here, this, is supposed, this was supposed to be up here, but this says, consider Christ Jesus who was faithful, okay? He was faithful. Contemplate that. Meditate in that. Man, it can't help but change you because you start thinking, yeah, Lord, you know what? Why should I give up on you? You've given me eternal life. You never gave up on me, Lord. Never. Not for one second. In John 4, 34, Jesus said this, my food, what really, and he's talking figuratively, what really, remember they were saying, who gave him something to eat? He's saying, hey, my whole life, my food, what I live for is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work, to do, to finish, to do it, to finish. And that is what our goal should be as well. We're only down here on earth for a sliver of a moment to do and to finish. The pastor I was under when I got saved had a world-famous sermon. He probably preached it 500 times around the world. But he talked about duty. Duty! Duty! Man, he would yell that out. He must have said that 100 times during that sermon. But you got the point. Man, you went away there, and you just thought, you know what? Jesus did God's will. That was his duty. And our duty is to do God's will as well. Okay? Verse 6 in Hebrews 3 tells us that if we are faithful to do God's will and to finish his work, we are going to be considered part of Jesus' house. And I'm going to put quotes around the word house because it's figurative. I'm not talking about a literal house Jesus is building out of brick and mortar. Okay? He's building a house, a special house, okay? One house that the passage talks about is the universe. Hebrews 1, 3, 1 through 6 talks about Jesus built this house, huge house. But now he, he does a semantic shift here. He does a word change, and now he's using the word house to illustrate something else, okay? This house that Jesus is building consists of born-again believers who will rule with him forever. You know what? We should all say, I want to be part of that house. That's a house I don't want to miss out being a part of, okay? Look at verse 6 again. But Christ, as a son, faithful apprentice son to the Father, as a son over his own house, now notice this, whose house, put it in quotes, whose house we are, if. That's a little word, but it's a massive word. This isn't saying every Christian is this way. It's saying, hey, everybody, hey, 
Christian people who are ready to give up, you're going to be considered part of his house if you hold fast the confidence. You hold fast your boldness. That's the word boldness. Come boldly to the throne of grace. Same word. Come with confidence to the throne of grace. Come boldly. And he's saying, you're going to need to hang on to being bold for Jesus till the end. Don't throw in the towel. You will be part of Jesus' eternal ruling house if you hold fast your boldness and the rejoicing of your hope firm to the end. Firm to the end. Not till the year before you die. Not the five years before you die. No. Firm to the end. Right up till the day that Jesus called you. And this brings us to lesson number two today. Only those who stand for Christ to the end will obtain the special reward, the special inheritance. Hey, let's, let me ask you this. Are we all heirs of God? Is everyone in this room an heir of God? Yeah, every one of us are an heir of God. But the next line in Romans 8 says, and joint heirs of Jesus if, there it is again, you're joint heirs of Jesus if you suffer for him. Suffer with him that you may be glorified together with him. What? All Christians are heirs of God, but if you want to be in this house, if you want to have the special reward, the special inheritance, hey, didn't the firstborn son in the Old Testament get, didn't he get a double portion? Yes, he did. The firstborn son got a double portion. And you know what? We can get a double portion in eternity and rule with Jesus. All oh, born-again people, whether good or bad or awful, will be with Jesus forever. He has promised that. But only those who hold their boldness and hope to the very end, firm to the end, will be part of his house will co-rule with him. Now, question. No, maybe the men might be, maybe it, the ladies will get my point here, but I'll, I'll tell them what the point was afterwards, but I'm going to use baseball here. Do you know what all these following Major League Baseball players have in common? I'm going to give their names, and I'm going to see if the men can figure it out. Mark McGuire, Barry Bonds, Sammy Sosa, Manny Ramirez, Alex Rodriguez, Jose Canseco, and Raphael Cole Mearing. Anybody want to take a shot at that? They all have something in common. I'll give you a hint. Any, okay, if you know the answer is raise your hand. Okay, I know it's a little difficult. Okay, how about this? It has to do with an award that Major League Baseball players can get after they retire. Okay, Gary. Yeah, I'll do it. Okay. But now me. But Okay. These men were all off the chart. Home run, RBIs, hits. They were at the very top. They're like in the top 10, top 25 of the greatest hitters of all time. But not one of them has their name in the Hall of Fame. Why? Because every single one of them took PEDs, performance-enhancing drugs, steroids, or something along those lines. And you know what? How many of these three of them were on the Rangers? Alex Rodriguez, A-Rod, Jose Canseco, the guy the ball bounced off his head into the bleachers on a home gun. <laughs> it went right off the top of his head. And then Rafael Palmero. These guys were amazing. They were amazing. But none of them are in the Hall of Fame. And you know, like Barry Bonds, he broke Hank Aaron's record for home runs at Lackland that was around forever. And he broke it. But they show pictures on the internet. You could look at Barry Bonds when he was first came into the majors, and he's this tall, slim brother that's holding his bat. He's just just nice and slim and muscular. Then you see him ten years later and he looks like Hulk. He's like you know, he's got muscles on muscles over here. What happened? Well, a lot of people say, oh, he just started working out. No, what he was doing is he was getting steroids, and it, it was, you know, turning these guys into even better 
hitters. You know what? They could have gotten in the Hall of Fame without all that stuff, but then they just had to, just to, had to enhance. And so they cheated. They were found unworthy by the hall, uh, by the, the sports writers who voted. They said, no, we can't put them in the hall. They cheated. And if we who are saved, if we turn away from God and live our lives in disobedience to him, like these guys disobeyed the rules of the Major League Baseball, we are not going to forfeit a bronze plaque in Cooperstown, New York. That's not what we forfeit. We forfeit the highest and greatest eternal reward that God offers to be part of his house, to be part of those who will rule with him forever and ever. All Christians will be with Jesus forever and ever and uh, will be wonderfully happy. But only those who obey and follow him to the end will rule and reign with him. You know what those baseball players did? It's similar to what God's people, the Jews, did coming out of Egypt. And that's where the writer of Hebrews, we didn't read this, so we're going to read it for the first time, but I'm going to go through these very quickly, okay? That's what the people coming out of Egypt did. It was similar. They both forfeited something because of how they lived. Okay, verses 7 and 8. Notice the writer uses Psalm 95. He's quoting all these things from Psalm 95, which had to do with the Exodus generation. And he's warning God's people that they drifted from God, and you're in danger of drifting from God. So verses 7, verses seven and 8, okay, there's the, the Exodus, the Jews who came out of Egypt. Uh, uh, okay, dramatization of that, a illustration of that's not obviously a real picture. Polaroid didn't come out until 1966 or something like that. All right, so verses 7 and 8 here. Okay, what were they doing in verses 7 and 8? They refused to listen to God. They hardened their hearts. They rebelled. Okay? Today, okay, today, he's talking to God's people in the New Testament now, but he's quoting the Old Testament. If you will hear his voice. Now, that does not mean that you put on your tape of the Bible and you hear it. No, this means listen. You're listening. Now, what is he saying? Okay. Today, if you'll listen to his voice, do not harden your hearts against it. Oh, you hear it, but you say, ah, I'm not going that way. No, thank you, Lord. <laughs> Don't harden your hearts as in the rebellion. They heard what Moses was saying, but they said, we're not doing what you say, Moses. We're not doing what you say, Joshua, Caleb. Don't harden your hearts as in the rebellion in the day of trial in the wilderness. So they, they refused to listen to God. They refused, they hardened their hearts, and they rebelled. Verse 9, they tested God. What does that mean? They wanted proof that they could trust what he said. That's what it means to test God. Lord, I know that you said that I should do this as a believer, but show me that you'll keep your promise. Show me that. You know, Satan tempted Jesus. Lord, if, er, if, you'll, if you'll turn, Jesus, if you'll turn all of these stones to bread, I'm going to do thus and such for you. You know, and he's tempting Jesus, and he's testing him to see if he'll follow through on what he wants, what the devil wants. Okay? Your fathers tested me, your ancestors tried me, and saw my works 40 years. So they hardened their hearts and rebelled. They tested God. They strayed from what was right. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said, they always go astray in their hearts. In verse 11, they refused to learn and follow God's word, and they have not known my ways. And now the result of all of these things, they were turning away from God in rebellion and in disobedience, and God said, So, therefore, I swore in my wrath, my anger, they shall not enter my rest. They are not going into the promised land. And what God's trying to say to you and I as New Testament believers, 
our, our rest, you know how like there's a lot of songs about uh, the promised land, going to the promised land, I'm bound for the promised land, the old hymn, Bo who will come and go with me, I'm bound for the promised land. That's, they say the promised land is heaven, but guess what? The promised land was in heaven in the Old Testament, and the promised land isn't, the, or I should say this, rest wasn't the promised land in the Old Testament, and rest is not heaven in the New Testament. When you read Hebrews, so many people, they see the word rest, they say, oh, that's getting into heaven. No, it's not. Because the rest that they were looking for was not in to get into heaven, it was to get their inheritance that God said, I'll give to you if you'll obey me. Same thing, our special inheritance, we don't get that automatically because we're God's children. You know, there's a lot of people that have will that say, my children get this automatically, but there are some that say, you know, like for instance, um, Dave Ramsey, you know, he's said it multiple times in public that he says, my children are in my will, but unless my children are, are in a Bible teaching church, and apparently he's going to have somebody that's going to adjudicate this to see whether these kids get their inheritance, but they've got to be in a good Bible teaching church. They got to be following Jesus faithfully. Then they will get an inheritance from Dave Ramsey, who is very wealthy. But if they're not, that promise goes out to the door. Same thing with Jesus. The Jews couldn't get into the land of Canaan and enjoy the land flowing with milk and honey because they rebelled. Christians today, New Testament believers, you don't get the special inheritance, you don't get the special reward of ruling with Christ, you forfeit that. Just like the uh, ball players forfeited their plaque and their fame and esteem in the Hall of Fame, the Old Testament saints fell dead in the wilderness, they did not enter the promised land, so can a child of God fall away and do all the sinful things that we talked about? Can, they, can, can a New Testament born-again believer who's on their way to heaven and will be in heaven, can they, can they harden their heart? Okay, nod your head. <laughs> can they rebel against God? Yes. Can they go astray? Of course. Just as the people of Israel failed. They failed to enter their rest, the promised land, when the writer in Hebrew says, don't fail to enter your rest, he's saying don't fail to become part of that house that Jesus is building. Don't fail at that. Because if you fail to do that, to be firm to the end in your boldness for Jesus and your, and your rejoicing, glorifying him, you will be, you'll be in the kingdom, but you'll forfeit it, the best of the kingdom, and you'll forfeit that. And so, that's the, the writer issues a stern warning to God's people. And again, this is so awesome because the writer's doing this on purpose. Look at this verse. Beware, brethren. These are unbelievers. You know, there's a lot of people in Christianity that'll say, well, these are fake believers because a real believer can't do those things. They, they are total totally wrong totally they were called holy brethren in verse one and now they're called brethren beware brethren hey robert uh, it's a little cool in the sanctuary can we turn it up the heat a little beware brethren lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living god notice that what is departing from the living god it's an evil heart of unbelief an evil heart it's evil if you turn away from your public profession to Jesus and you just crawl into a hole somewhere and say, hey, I'm going away from God. I'm tired. I'm, I'm, I'm tired of it. I'm getting beat up for it. I'm paying a price, and it's too much. I'm just going to stick the shovel in the ground and wait here. No. Beware. You know what beware means? But, verse 13, exhort Again, don't forget, exhort means two things in Greek. Encourage, erinere. Encourage, erinere. So sometimes it means clear, it means encourage. Sometimes it means warn. But we need to be doing this, both of those things, with one another. 
encourage one another, warn one another daily. While it's called today, while we have this life, before people go astray, okay? Before they pass away in sin and unbelief. Exhort, encourage, warn one another daily while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Why do we have church? Why do we gather together here as a family? We go to classes, we encourage one another, we talk to one another, we share with one another. Why do we do that? Why do we have elders? Why do we have overseers who are watching out for God's people and praying for them and doing their best to try to motivate them and get them to be faithful to church, to faithful to God, to be faithful to generosity and giving and all the things that God wants us to do. Why? Why is that? Because of your, lest you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. So how do people go off the rails for God? Okay. And again, we're dealing with people here, everybody, who are turning away from God. They're, they're, they're saying, it's over. I'm not serving God anymore. I'm going to do my thing. Okay, so this is very serious. Okay, this isn't like falling into sin. And then, and then you know, even, even like, for instance, backsliding or going, okay, that's different. Uh, this, is, this is like full-blown prodigal son, gone in the far country, and so on and so forth. Okay, so it says, okay, I know where I was going. Lest you be hardened. How do you get hardened? Well, you start off Hebrews 2, not taking that warning. Beware lest you drift away. You've got to listen carefully to what Jesus is saying to you, lest you drift away. But then when you start drifting, then what you start is doing is doubting an evil heart of unbelief. D, drifting, D, doubting, an evil heart of unbelief. In fact, this word can also mean disloyalty. Ah, pistanas. Ah, like ah, theist, atheist. Ah, not, not theist, not a theist. Ah, pistas, no faith or faithlessness or disloyalty. Okay, so this is a flexible word. Beware, uh, lest you have an evil heart of disloyalty, of unfaithfulness in departing from the living God. And it's unbelief, too, because you're not taking him at his word. So it's, it's a multifaceted word. Verse 14, we get the why. Why? Why should we beware? Why should we exhort one another? Because for, verse 14, we have become partakers of Christ. The Greek says this, we have become partners with the Messiah. The word the, the definite article is there in Greek. We have become partners with the Messiah. Oh, I love that. I love that rendering in the Greek. They botched it in the English. We have become, see, because what does partakers sound like? Well, we become a Christian. We become partakers of Christ. If we hold, and that's why people go off the deep end. So, we have become partners with the Messiah, co-rulers. This is, was in chapter 1. It was earlier in chapter 3 in verse 1. But here, it's clear that the context here is we become part of that house. We become partners with the Messiah in ruling forever if, there that is again, we hold the beginning of our boldness steadfast to the end. Okay? So, we see, whenever you see the word if, man, in your Bible, let's put a big circle around that and just say, hey, this isn't, this isn't, obviously this is not talking to how people stay saved. Brethren, we become a born again, we have become born again believers if we hold the beginning of our boldness steadfast in the end. That flies in the face of the Gospel of John and so many other salvation passages, it's not funny. And yet, a huge percentage, the majority of Christendom, believes that's what it's saying. It is not. 
And this brings us to our last message, or last lesson today. You don't want another message after this one? Or okay, number three. We must be extremely careful. Okay, beware. Be extremely careful. Sin can harden our hearts and cause us to depart from God and cause us to lose our eternal rule with Christ. Sin can do that to yours truly, and it can do it to you. And listen, the Apostle Paul himself in 1 Corinthians 9 said, I buffet my body. I beat it around. I smack it around. And I, I buffet my body and bring it into submission. Okay, of course it's figurative, right? Just not literally taking a cat of nine tails, <laughs> whipping himself. But he's saying, I am, I am, through the Spirit of God, telling my body how it's going to live. With his help, with his power, I'm not taking anything for granted. I buffet my body daily and bring it into subjection, lest after having preached to others, I myself should be adakamas, disqualified, disapproved. You know that verse that says we should be uh, the, the Awanas, uh, the Awana verse that is over the entire Awana program, you know, to be those workers who do not need to be ashamed. That would be, do, they do not need to be disapproved. And Paul said, I, I could, after I preach to others, I could be disapproved by God at the judgment seat of Christ. So Paul put himself, and so did, by, by the way, everybody, so did the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews 3. Beware, brethren, lest there be an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. For we have become partners with the Messiah, me and you, if, <laughs> he says, if I don't do this, I don't get it either. Okay, so don't forget that, okay? Now, we don't lose our salvation ever. That's impossible. Listen, Jesus promised, whoever believes in me, and by the way, I got to share this with a lady this past Tuesday, and she was wonderfully saved. Wonderfully saved. It was awesome. So thankful. I praise God. But I showed her John 5, 24. Whoever hears my word, believes in him who sent me, has everlasting life. Bing! The lights go on in her brain. Has everlasting life. You're not having to wait till you die to figure out what, yeah. Yeah, like everybody else thinks. You have to wait till you die to get final salvation. No. Whoever believes in Jesus has everlasting life, has eternal life. It's forever. If you have something that's everlasting, how long will you have? Forever. So we can't lose our salvation. That's impossible. So that's one thing we learned from this passage. But what do we lose? We lose our master's praise. We lose our right to rule in his glorious kingdom. You all remember Lee Strobel. We've done things by Lee Strobel. Okay? He did an interview of Charles Templeton. Now, he did it at the end of Charles Templeton's life. This is Charles Templeton's picture back in the four, late 40s, early 50s when he toured the world, mostly the United States. I believe that he toured 44 states and spoke with Billy Graham. So he would speak, and Billy Graham would speak. He would speak, and Billy Graham would speak. So he and Billy Graham were right-hand uh, men of each other. Okay? They were a blessing, an encouragement. But you know what? Charles Templeton began to drift. He began to drift. And he began to doubt the Genesis account of creation. He started to become an evolutionist. And then he decided that the Bible's teaching on hell can't be real that that can't be true, that it's unfair, it's unjust, that it makes God need, and all that kind of stuff. So he began to doubt the existence of hell. And you know what? He eventually became an atheist. He became an atheist. Here's a guy that preached all over America. He motivated as a young man, he motivated teenagers in that, in that era, adults as well. And eventually, he writes a book as an atheist called Farewell to God. He, 
He's an example of a Christian who listened to human opinion rather to, than to God's word. He listened to other people rather than to God. He hardened his heart against the Bible, and he died as an atheist. I think this picture was one of the ones maybe that Lee Strobel took. I'm not 100% sure, but when he was interviewing him just prior to his death, he died an atheist. What did he do? He threw away eternal riches for earthly honors. Oh, boy, I'm an author. Oh, boy. He threw away eternal riches for earthly honors that amounted to basically nothing. So how important, everybody, is faithfulness and fidelity to God? How important is that? To obeying his word, to hating hating sin. You remember Hebrews 1, verse 8 about Jesus? You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of joy more than your, there's that word again, more than your partners, more than your companions, those that are going to rule with you. Jesus has ultimate joy. We will share that joy if we remain faithful. All these things I talked about, faithfulness, fidelity, obeying God's word, hating sin, these are all massively important. If we fail to stay faithful to God, we're going to be like Esau. We talked about him last week. He gave his inheritance as a firstborn son to his younger brother for a bowl of soup. That's a word picture for you and I. Are you willing to sell away an, an eternal reward of ruling with Jesus and being part of his inner core for a lousy bowl of soup, spiritually speaking? The devil... If that happens to us, the devil will have deceived us into thinking that the things of this present life are more important than doing God's will. I'm going to close with this story, okay? I love this story. It's probably been 10 or 12 years. I can't remember the last time I told this, but this story is from the movie Hashi, A Dog's Tale. I don't know if you've seen that movie, but it's based, listen to this, this, this truly happened uh, in real life, other than the very end of the movie. <laughs> but it really happened. There was a dog that was like this, and I want to tell you about him. Richard Gere here in the movie, he played Parker Wilson. Parker Wilson was a college professor of music, by the way. And he would step off the commuter train at the end of the day, day after day, take it to the university, come back at night. And he steps off of the train one night, and there is a puppy there. And that puppy was coming a long distance. It was coming from Japan to where uh, Wilson lived in Woonsocket, Rhode Island, okay? So this Akita puppy was in a crate, and it got loose. And so when he came off of the, of the train, the Akita puppy runs up to him, and he picks him up, and he's trying to figure out who does this belong to, and nobody claims this dog. So he says, okay, you know what, I'm going to take this dog, and I'm going to put, you know, pictures all over my city. I'm going to put little posters on the telephone poles, and I'm going to say, hey, do you recognize this dog? You know, I found this dog, and I want you to have your dog. It's got a, um, a uh, collar, and I'm going to come to that in just a second here. I won't give it away. But Wilson takes the dog home. And he wants to find its owner, but before long, guess what? They become best friends, all right? They love one another, and even though his wife doesn't want a dog, she's resisting him, he just can't let it go. He just loves the dog too much. And so she finally gives in and says, okay, you can keep the dog, uh, or until they find, somebody, we find the owner. Well, at the college, at the university, one day a colleague who's Japanese uh, he notices the tag on the collar is what they, what they call Hashi, H-A-C-H-A, H-A-C-H-I, Hashi. It's the Japanese word for the number eight, okay? That becomes Wilson's new name for his pet, Hashi. That's a great name. He's from Japan. He's all the way over here in Rhode Island. We'll call him Hashi, okay? So not long after this, name in the dog, Hashi 
follows Wilson when he leaves for work one morning. He follows him out the door. And he follows him all the way to the train station blocks away. And he goes there, and then Wilson sees him there. He says, hush, and he picks him up, and he walks him all the way back home, and he puts him in the house, and, you know, he's probably telling him, hey, stay there, don't, don't follow me. And so he goes back, he goes to school. But what Hashi does is somehow, some way, he gets out. And that evening, he goes to the train station. And as soon as Wilson gets off the train, he runs right up to him. And, he, and you know what? In the movie, what happens is Hashi the dog, every day, he begins to go there and sit down and curl up and wait for his master to come off the train. He does it on Monday. He does it on Tuesday. He does it on Wednesday. And you know what? He begins to do this day after day. And then he begins to do it week after week. And then he does it month after month. Every time he goes to, to the university, that dog's there waiting for him. And believe it or not, everybody, believe it or not, he does this not just for weeks and months. He does this for 10 years. True story. He is there every day that Wilson's getting off of the train. He's there waiting for his master faithfully. 10 years in a row. His devotion and faithfulness to his master is amazing. But in the course of the movie and in the course of real life, the professor, Wilson, has a heart attack in his classroom, and he passes away. He couldn't be revived. And what happens is that evening, Hashi goes to the train. But Wilson's not getting off the train, and he just stays there. And he's waiting and waiting and waiting. And finally, it gets dark, and he begins to take his trek home. And the next day, he doesn't know what's happened. He's waiting there for his master the next day. And you know what, everybody? He does that year after year after year for like a decade. He's waiting for the master who will never return. And the way the movie ends, and I think this is where they use some artistic license, the dog is now old, and he lays down for the last time. He curls up. And he, uh, he's there, and he is closing his eyes. And apparently, the dog begins to dream. And what does he see? As he's sitting there in the dream, he sees the train door open up, and he sees his master come on. And it's like real life to the dog who apparently is passing away and he sees his master come off the train and he rushes into the arms of his master and he hugs him and he's so happy that after all those years he sees his master anew and afresh who he's been waiting for faithfully day in day out he's so happy to see him and do I even need to tell you how to resolve this story. I mean, do I even have to say anything here at the end? This is what you and I should be doing to the very end, to the very end. One day, Jesus is going to want to give you and I, he's going to want to give you and I an inheritance that's far above eternal life. This is the special inheritance. He's going to want to give you dominion over the earth in some way. And you know what? That is not going to go to those who cheated. It's not going to go to those who, who turned away and, and, and they hardened their hearts and they did things their way in life like, um, like uh, Charles Templeton did. No, this is going to his faithful ones. Who like that picture I showed you earlier where the guy's coming across the finish line. You're faithful to the end. Revelation 2, 26. To the one who overcomes. To the one who is victorious. That's overcome. Whoever is victorious. 
and keeps my works till the end. To him or her, I will give power over the nations. I'm going to rule them with a rod of iron. But I'll give you power and authority over the nations. That is a very, very special reward to those who Jesus is going to want to invite. I mean, he's going to want to be part of his house, who Jesus is going to make part of his house. Okay? Listen, even right now, we're part of that house if we maintain our faithfulness to Jesus. But if we ever go off the rails and turn away from him, quit going to church, quit serving God, quit giving, and all the things that we're supposed to do, all the many, many things, encouraging one another, loving one another, praying for one another, all those things, we quit doing those things, then God will remove us from that list unless we get back in line. But any believer who dies in that condition, they will be like, just like the Hall of Fame baseball players who never got into the Hall of Fame. <laughs> That's what will happen. They'll be in heaven forever, but they will not be dealing with the master. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. Man, the, the book of Hebrews is amazing. It's got the encouragements we need, but man, it's got the warnings we need. Yeah, this is serious business. This is what our whole life should revolve around is, like I said earlier this year, around New Year's is pressing toward the mark for the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I press toward the mark. Yes, and Lord, help us as your people. Lord, there are people here listening to the word. There are people far away, Lord, in other states. God, how we pray for all that are listening today. God, we pray that they, if they are not following you faithfully. They're not dedicated to you. They're making a lot of excuses. Lord, so many of our members, I'll call them and they'll say, you know, Pastor Bob, I'm so sorry, and I'm, I'm always making excuses. And that's what happens. They're drifting. And that drifting can turn into doubt and it can turn into all kinds of as we're going to see later in the book of Hebrews, things getting worse and worse and worse. So, Father, what do we ask? We ask you that you would help us to beware. You would help us to beware that we would recognize that, Lord, this is so serious. And there, that we could definitely suddenly have an evil heart, disloyalty and unbelief in departing from the living God. God, may that never be. Help us to stay strong to the very, very end. And we pray these things, Jesus, in your precious name and for your sake. Amen.